Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. Matt, Matt Boer of the Village of Cleveland is a Democratic candidate in the 6th Congressional District. Matt, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me. Well, since your campaign started, you've been around the district. Tell me what your number one issue is, Matt. Number one is renewable energy. I support renewable energy. I'm a longtime uh, practitioner of renewable energy, and I think it's a great economic as well as a uh, environmental engine to revitalize the rural parts of the 6th District, of which there are many. Uh, for every 8 to 10 wind turbines you see, that's about one full-time job that cannot be outsourced. Uh, there's, we've seen recent developments in solar power here in uh, Wisconsin, and I think there's a lot more room for that sort of thing. Well, has the Trump administration been, been a friend of uh, alternative energy or not so much? I'd say maybe not as bad as people were afraid that it could have been. Okay. If, if that's a pretty political answer. Yep. I would say that in general, when we're talking about any sort of subsidies or incentives for renewable energy, or at really any program, you want something to be like long lasting. So that way people can either plan towards something, away from something, with something, around it. Uh, anytime you have uh, any sort of a subsidy that that expires and needs to be extended on a year by year basis, given the, the scope and breadth and the time it takes to finance things, okay. that really doesn't do a lot of, uh, doesn't do anybody any favors. Well, if you're in Congress then, um, are you gonna offer new incentives for renewable energy? And if so, what type of incentives? Well, right now we have, there's a couple things out there. The one that I'm most familiar with is the production tax credit. Mm -hmm. It's basically, uh, it incentivizes uh, utilities to develop wind farms and things like that. And basically the, the production tax credit, it's been around for a number of years, but it's been one of these things where it, it's kind of come and gone a number of times. And again, any sort of a policy like that where it disappears and then comes back, an incentive that shows up and then it's not voted on for another 18 months, then maybe it's back for a year or so, that's problematic. Uh, really what they need is a, a five or 10 year runway where again, people can plan for things. Okay, um, let's move, move on to some specific national issues. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear whether, uh, whether Obamacare is legal. If the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court throws out Obamacare, what do you think should be the alternative and what, what would you line up in favor of single payer or what, uh, what would be your reaction? I like the idea of some sort of broadly accessible public option, but I don't like the idea that people wouldn't have a choice. Uh, this is a country of choice. People appreciate choice. And frankly, I've had some health insurances that were private, private that were very good, and I wouldn't want to let go of them. And I know there's a lot of people in that position too. So I don't like the idea of any sort of like large, uh, you know, system that's forced upon people where they, they wouldn't have a say in it. So would you want to keep then Obamacare plus uh, work towards a work towards a, a public option? Yes, I think that's a great that's a great option. That's a great way to go. Uh, I enjoy some of the points of the Affordable Care Act, specifically the fact that uh, if an individual has some sort of pre existing condition there, they can still get health care. I think that was an eye opener for a lot of individuals. But I, again, with this, with COVID right now, I think we're seeing some of the problems that have been revealed by having an individual's health insurance or health care strictly tied to their employment. We need we need some sort of broader, more accessible option. Let's go back to your first answer. Are you a champion of renewable energy because of the threat that climate change poses? Climate change poses, Matt. Well, that's that's a big question. I would say climate change, I think it's real. Um, I should mention that my undergraduate work at DePaul University in Chicago was in environmental science. 
So that's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. I'd say when you look at things like, let's just boil it down very simply to carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. If the climate wasn't warming slightly, that would be weirder than if it was, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so I, I think, I do believe that climate change is real and it, there's, it's incumbent upon us to do something about this. Uh, I also think that renewable energy is a way to address that. If we look at uh, specifically wind and solar power, those are two modes of generating power that are non-combustive and you're also not using any water. There are other types of uh, power generation where even if you're not like using the water specifically, you're still heating it up and using that to cool down some sort of a large reactor or a boiler of some sort. And that creates uh, what we call thermal pollution. Wind and solar do not have those issues. Okay. Um, let's talk about COVID-19. Uh, Congress and the, has passed and the president have signed, uh, as you know, uh, a few packages. Uh, do we need yet another COVID-19 relief package? And if so, who should it be targeted to help? That's a great question. I have been somewhat critical of the $2.2 trillion stimulus package that was, that was passed. I felt like... Um, rather than offer low interest loans to individuals, I would have liked to see individuals and businesses uh, basically like relieved of payments instead of uh, getting a loan to make payments in the short term, because eventually those are gonna come, come due and we really can't account for or totally understand how long it's going to take for the economy to return to some sort of normal. Right. So I would have seen it in order of preference, I would have liked to see people offer debt relief as opposed to slightly more lower lower interest debt, if that makes sense. In terms of any sort of a stimulus going forward, I, I enjoy seeing money paid out to individuals so they can make a choice. That would be the, the second most preferred option next to debt relief. Well, um, as we continue to use federal aid to prop up the economy, the, is, the, is the whole debate over the national debt growing significantly, is that to be discarded and to be a, a, a issue to be taken up later? Wow. Well, I'll tell you, we're, we're sitting at about what, 23 trillion and some change right now. That's an awful lot of zeros. Ironically, the incumbent in this district, Glenn Grothman, when he was uh, running in 2014, I, I think that's right, one of his largest issues was out of control spending in Washington, DC. Well, look at us right now. I think we're about $8 billion past that. The, the national debt in the last uh, five years has risen, risen about $8, billion, $8 trillion. Again, that's an awful lot of zeros. We have to address this. I mean, at this point, we're just, we're writing, we're writing checks that I don't know who is going to be able to back at some point. And uh, frankly, I've, I've got a, a lot of concerns about where where and when inflation is going to kick in. I mean, money is only so cheap for so long. Inflation has to rear its ugly head. Uh, why it hasn't yet, I don't totally understand. I've worked with uh, you know friends who are economists and involved in financial markets, and there's a, there's a lot of questions out there. But the idea that we're just borrowing, you know, multiples of what the uh, you know the GDP can be, uh, that's that's scary. That, that chicken has to roost sometime. Well, the whole Medicare, Medicaid, all those cost projections, they're not, they're not reliable anymore because of COVID, but social, social Security is still scheduled at some point to run out of money. How, how, how would you fix so, Social Security? That's a great question. I mean, certainly Social Security has to, it has to survive, right? I mean, when, when the system was devised uh, you know, decades ago, it was understood that uh, a very small percentage of the country would actually ever collect it for, for a host of reasons. And now, I mean, I was just playing around with my, um, when I'm feeling really brave, sometimes I'll look at uh, you know, a portfolio right now and try to see how I'm doing and planning and things like that. And uh, sure as heck, right, right there in my portfolio, they just, they just factor in what they think uh, social security will be at that point. And uh, it's, it's just part of people's planning right now. So I think uh, 
we have we have to you know continue to fund Social Security. We have to figure out where that money's coming from, and uh, and, and you know treat it like uh, the realistic uh, thing that it is, which is you know if people are going to start collecting Social Security at sixty two and sixty seven, and the population is living until well after or older than that age, you have to uh, you know define reality and then move accordingly. The Supreme Court recent, recently said. President Trump, you may have authority to abolish DACA, but you didn't do it right. Um, what's your thought on the future of the uh, the enrollees in DACA who were brought he- into this country as children? I think, well, first things first, whenever we're talking about immigration in general, it's important that we remember that we are a country of immigrants. Um, my family came here about 100, 120 years ago And it wasn't because, you know, we were uh, some sort of like aristocracy in Europe and we decided to see what it would be like to, uh, you know, work for a living for a handful of uh, generations. Uh, You know, and I think whenever we talk, you hear words about like, you hear terms like qualified immigration or, you know, special skill sets and trying to cherry pick, you know, skill sets from other countries. You have to be really careful because some of that, I think, kind of casts a... uh, has almost shadows of ra- racism kind of like baked into it. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't like that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so we are a country of immigrants, and that is one of the things that makes us wonderful. I'll say that in terms of uh, employment, even through, even though right now our U plus six unemployment is about 18%, we still need individuals to work here. Uh, there's still a labor shortage in, a, in many different ways. And again, immigration is a solution to that. Uh, in terms of anybody that's been here for a while that's working that doesn't have a any sort of a violent past or some sort of like a, a violent history, they should definitely be offered a some sort of a path to, you know, continuing to work here in a legal way. They shouldn't be afraid that, you know, ICE is going to kick in their door uh, when they've just been, you know, working, trying to uh, make their life here and, you know, following all the rules, especially if, uh, you know, they're you know, they came here as a child and it wasn't their decision to begin with. Okay. Um, The whole national debate over whether we need police reforms in training, whether we need to ban chokeholds, whether we need to ban no-knock warrants, uh, do we need some major changes? Just with respect to uh, police reform or are we looking at criminal justice reform in general? Both. If you you have positions on both, both please. Okay, okay. Um, So, okay, in terms of police reform, um, I think when we're talking about the the nature of people, human nature, uh, there are are always going to be bad actors in whatever whatever field you choose to be in. Believe it or not, there's politicians that uh, take bribes. Uh, I hope that doesn't uh, shake things up here, but that does happen. Uh, You've also got nurses that uh, might not act in the best interest of their patient for one reason or another. And you also have dirty cops out there. Um, When we're talking about, and we have to be ever vigilant as a society against these bad bad actors in our midst. uh, In our midst, in terms of uh, police reform, I definitely think that uh, more training could be uh, could be a solution to this, as well as uh, refresher training just on you know later later the latest techniques, and um, I think that's that's. That's my answer uh, with okay. respect to police reform. In terms of criminal justice reform, uh, I'm a staunch advocate of uh, decriminalizing uh, marijuana at the uh, federal level and allowing states to make their own decisions as to how to regulate it, if they want to sell it, if they don't want to sell it, that should be their decision. Uh, in speaking with a lot of uh, attorneys, as well as uh, law enforcement, I feel uh, the, the widespread sentiment is that there's an awful lot of bandwidth taken up on nonviolent marijuana offenses. And that would be a very simple way to frankly just free up bandwidth in the the criminal justice system be to take those people out of this. Okay. We've talked about a bunch of issues. Any other issues important to your campaign that we haven't touched on yet? I want to give you a chance to to mention. Sure. Sure. I appreciate that very much. And again, I appreciate you asking me out here uh, you know, to to do this interview. This is really cool. Thank you. I'd say one thing that hasn't come up here would be um, 
I, I support revisiting the Authorized Use of Military Force Act 2001. Okay. That was uh, something that happened right after 9-11. And basically what it does is it allows the executive branch, basically grants the executive branch full authority to you know, pursue individuals or countries or harboring individuals or harboring countries that might have something to do with, uh, with uh, terrorism, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very important in that moment. But uh, I believe there also needs to be some sort of a sunset clause added to that. As you look at things the way we stand right now, we've been at war for 18 years. That's longer than World War I, World War II, the Civil War, and uh, pre-armistice Korea combined. That's, that's pretty wild, and that's, uh, that needs to stop. Congress, one of their duties is to declare acts of war and then decide how they're going to be paid for. And essentially, the Authorized Use of Military Force Act lets them off the hook. I don't like that. Okay. Um, last question. Do you want to highlight differences between you and your two primary opponents on August 11th? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so I work as a, in a business capacity at a, a, an office in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. We're a large metal fabrication shop. Uh, we make a lot of uh, really huge fabrications that are really, really interesting. And I am a business person. I have my MBA from Marquette in Milwaukee, and I'm very proud of that. I I've always been a hardworking person. My, uh, you know, my mother was a special education teacher. My father had his own small business. When I say small business, I mean it was him plus uh, one employee. <laughs> and uh, when I would come home from, uh, from school and there were drop cloths in the family room, I knew that we had to uh, assemble a bunch of plumbing components all night long. <laughs> so that's kind of the where I came from. Uh, I've made Wisconsin my home. I absolutely love it. And uh, I just want the best for everyone in the 6th District. In terms of what really sets me apart, I would say my experience in the business world uh, makes me very relatable to a lot of uh, you know fence sitters, moderates, people that uh, may have voted for a more conservative candidate in the past and they're not getting the, the return that they want. I fully understand a lot of issues that many businesses go through. And I, again, I feel like that's something that really sets me apart from anyone else in this field. Okay, thank you. Matt, uh, Matt Bohr of the Village of Cleveland is a Democratic candidate in the 6th Congressional District. The primary is August 11th. Matt, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too, thank you, sir. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.